So, um, I would like to start by seeing if anybody can hear me at all. Good. I'd like to start by thanking everybody um, from the centre, Ayel and Galit and Do and everybody else, um, for inviting me here. It's um, a quite a common visit for me quite on, uh, in terms of uh, coming out and, and um, speaking as well in, in various opportunities in Israel and Palestine the last uh, few years. Um, but it's always an interesting context to, to speak to. It feels like context where there is a sort of response that you can expect uh, in terms of maybe in Northwestern Europe uh, there's more of an apathy or a lack of, uh, a lack of engagement perhaps. So it's always something quite encouraging in a sense to be here despite all the problems. Um, on that note, I think the discussion this afternoon was amazingly uh, instructive and also inspiring for me in lots of ways. It made me think quite a lot about uh, some of the things that I was going to say. Um, but also made me aware that it's very difficult to act to follow, I have to say. From, uh, uh, so I'm going to um, try and divide the talk into two parts. To speak um, initially, um, rather more as a kind of information session about um, the museum that I run in Eindhoven. Um, because most of you, I'm sure, haven't been there and haven't seen it. Um, so this will be rather descriptive, but what I really want to do is, 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 is afterwards, I'll try and do this relatively quickly, um, to try and engage with some of the questions that came up this, this afternoon from my point of view, because, um, and maybe to continue that into the discussion later on, um, because I think they were very important, particularly questions of public engagement, the public sphere, the influence of the museum on the public sphere. I think that's really crucially where we're at at the moment and how we understand the role of the museum or how we get either optimistic or pessimistic about its possibilities. Um, so that will happen later when I talk about some of these criteria. What I want to do to start with is to introduce you to another place. So to switch from Israel at the moment to the northwest corner of Europe um, and to um, a small town in the southern Netherlands called Eindhoven. Um, now, Eindhoven is uh, near to the, the borders of Belgium and Germany, um, but is nevertheless extremely Dutch. Um, it is also quite a peculiar place. Probably you have similar uh, cities in, uh, in Israel, cities which are based around a factory. Um, and basically the idea of Eindhoven was to be a dormitory for the workers of the factory town. Um, in some ways it reminds me a lot of uh, Łódź in, uh, in Poland, in the same idea of a, uh, a city which is... Uh, fundamentally productive. Nobody goes there unless you produce something that's sent away from it. There's no reason to come to that city unless you're making something for export. Um, so the city itself is in a sense a sort of vacant city or a vacated city. It's vacated of culture, it's vacated of presence because its presence is, is producing absence. The presence of the, of the material that are being produced in the factories all, always predicts an absence. In other words, they're, they're, they're leaving the city for the world. The, um, the factory that uh, Eindhoven is based upon is Philips, which is light bulbs, um, but also um, very many other things from medical equipment through to technology. And in a way, I suppose Eindhoven was lucky that it happened that Philips, making light bulbs, landed in Eindhoven rather than, for instance, the textile manufacturers. There are towns nearby which were based on textile manufacturing, and they were completely decimated in the 80s with the uh, redistribution of capitalism through the... Um, through the globalization of capitalism initially in the early 80s and then after 89 with the introduction of the former socialist world into the capitalist system. Um, those towns were completely eradicated, but because Phillips, by pure coincidence, was a technology-based city, it managed to survive, and it's gone through some hard times. A lot of the factories actually producing, for instance, the light bulbs, but also the, uh, the consumer goods, uh, televisions, etc., um, have been exported to China and to Malaysia and various other Asian destinations, also a little bit to Eastern Europe. Um, but the, the um, research, the sort of knowledge base, in a way, has remained in Idaho. So um, its peculiarity, in a sense, is that it, it, is that it belongs to Philips, but it also has, through Philips, a certain international presence. And again, it's an international presence of people that come in quite temporarily. It's a city where people move through rather than stay for so long, at least the international community. Um, and it's a city which you emigrate to still, or immigrate to still, in order to work for a particular factory. So that tradition of coming to the city in order to work and producing something that you send away is still valid even now, even with the high technology of the research. So it goes on from the beginnings of Philips in the 1890s, over 100 years to today that same mentality. Now, into that mentality um, was um, founded this museum. 
1936. The date is quite interesting. It's before the Second World War, um, as you know. <laughs> it's also um, before um, one of the earlier museums, the, the, the first museum of modern art that identifiably wanted to co collect its own time was the Museum of Modern Art in 1929. The second museum was in 1930 in Łódź, the kind of sister city of, uh, of uh, um, Eindhoven in many ways, um, uh, in Łódź in 1930, Museum Sztuki. Um, and there were a number of museums that started to open in the 30s, but this is relatively early. So 1936 for a museum dedicated to modern art is relatively early. Um, and it was not founded like Wood, for instance, within an avant-garde tradition, but rather as a bourgeois demonstration of wealth by one man, Henri Van Aver. Van Aver was the only other employer of significance at that time in the city except for Phillips. Um, and so the Van Aver name, not being Phillips, in a sense makes this uh, this museum a kind of stranger within its own city because everything else, and by that I mean everything, from the music centre to the football team, if you know about football, the PSV, Eindhoven, which is the most famous football team, the P is for Phillips. It's Phillips Sporting Verein, um, Phillips Sports United. Um, so everything was named and, and, uh, and to a large extent controlled by Phillips. It, it's even said that the city council um, wasn't really a city council, it was just the sub-board of Phillips until around 1970. That, that Phillips decided what the, what the city would do and that the democratic process was simply followed it until around 1970 when things started to change. Um, so the Van Aver Museum sits a little bit uh, strangely in a sense. It sits within a bourgeois tradition of the, the, um, the, the few people in, in Eindhoven who, who had the money, the, basically the oligarchs of that time, including Van Aver. Van Aver was a cigar manufacturer, so the foundation of the mu museum is based on tobacco, which is also quite interesting given the politics of tobacco at the moment. Um, and the reason he moved to Van Aver is that the, the labour was cheap, uh, and um, cigar manufacturing is very labour intensive because you have to roll the cigars by hand. So therefore he needed cheap labour and it's exactly the same reason that Phillips moved. Phillips moved to um, Eindhoven because they, uh, they could then use the farming families who were extremely poor in the 1890s, 1880s around Eindhoven, invite them to come to the city, they gave them a house and a small plot of land and then they, they employed their daughters up to the age of 13 because their daughters had small enough fingers to be able to put the filament in of the light bulb itself. Uh, and so they were encouraged, and the more daughters you had, the more likely you were to get a job within Phillips. Um, so you see this, this, this kind of, uh, the birth of the city in this, uh, in this um, peculiar, um, kind of early, early version of a, of, of a sort of a cheap labor, flight of capital to, to, to cheap labor, moving from Amsterdam to Eindhoven. An early version of a kind of globalization which we're very familiar with now is where it was based. Where it was based. Anyway, this building was built um, by Van Aver and given to the city council in a complex deal which involves him paying no tax. Again, a very familiar story, I think, from today. Um, this but this was, was built in 1936, opened in 1936, and <coughs> went through the Second World War. Also, during the National Socialist time in the Netherlands, it was used as a gallery for a period. It's quite interesting. Um, it was also used as the headquarters for the, the police at certain times um, and as one of the few representative buildings in the city in 1936, it was also used by the National Socialist City Council for their grand balls. And there's actually rumours of Van Aber, one of the, the kind of apocryphal stories of Van Aber is that there was a book where every citizen of Eindhoven who att attended these balls and therefore signed up to the ideology of National Socialism, at least um, superficially, um, was, um, was, uh, was left in the Van Aver archive for a period. And then around 1946, um, there was a strange disappearance of the archives of the Van Aver Museum. The archives of the Van Aver Museum were either burnt or destroyed, anyway they disappeared. And we actually tried to trace them. We actually put an advert in the newspaper to ask people from Eindhoven to give us accounts of what the Van Aver Museum had been during the period 1940 after the, 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 the German occupation until 45. Um, and um, there, a few people came forward, obviously it's beginning to be out of, of living memory, but a few people came forward. Uh, but it's remarkable that everyone who came forward was on the side of the resistance during the war. And everyone who, who, who accounted for Van Aver said that of course they never went there and their parents never went there, but they knew somebody who did. So it's strange how these lingering um, fictions um, of the museum, these lingering fictions of its place in Eindhoven survive. Um, 
the history of, of, of Eindhoven, which I won't go into, is, is mostly average and undistinguished, at least in terms of its architecture. Um, it has a, a facade of careless but increasingly less secure affluence, I would say, that the Netherlands, that the Netherlands took on after the 1960s, while being so unremarkable that its very anonymity and lack of quality might even make it no noteworthy, a kind of Stadt ohne Eigenschaften, you could say, a city without qualities. However, in a few areas it stands out head and shoulders above similar middle-sized Western European towns. And that's in its Philips, in its football team, and also in its Van Abbe. Um, the, the bourgeois legacy, which is, which is inherited through the Philips, the whole Philips story, um, of investment in the city, investment in the, in the well-being of the city, um, is something which Van Abbe Museum um, taps into. So its foundation is an idea of education, an idea of giving uh, good, um, good values to the people, of, to the workers of the city. It's related in a very different way from, from En Herald, but it's related to an idea of a bourgeois education system for the workers. It's not so much about entertainment at that point. Of course, later, those, all those uh, agendas of entertainment and mass publics come in. But at that point, it's not, it's not really in, uh, invested in that. Um, and um, strangely, in a sense, it, it, I told them maybe because of Phillips and the internationalism of Phillips, had certain ambitions beyond its station, beyond its, its level that you might expect from a small 200,000 provincial city in the Netherlands. Um, and this was reflected in the period after the Second World War when Eddie de Wilde, who's a, um, a famous name in, in museum history from uh, the period of 1940s until 1970s really, continues to be the uh, director of the Stedelijk Museum into the 1970s. Um, and he took over, when he was about 22, he took over the directorship and he opened what's called in the history of the museum the first chapter of the museum. Um, the museum was divided into four chapters and I started the fifth chapter in 2004 when I came in. Um, he made a crucial decision that the city council at the time um, wanted the uh, museum to become a museum of the Dutch Golden Age, in other words of Rembrandt and of the, the, the period of the 18th century. Um, 17th century, when um, the Dutch were conquerors of the world and New York was called New Amsterdam. And there's this kind of nostalgic feeling for that moment and the Netherlands still exists. And, um, and he fought them, fought the city council and said um, on the grounds of, of, uh, of uh, saving money that it would be impossible for a decent collection of golden age paintings to be developed here, but we could buy modern art. It was eventually decided that modern art would be the focus of the, of the city. That had been the focus in 1936 when it was founded, but then obviously after the Second World War, and after all the books were burnt and the, and the secrets were buried, uh, then they had to remake it. And the remaking of it was a moment where, where the modern, modern art, the contemporary art aspect of the museum was fixed. The history of the museum then is written in terms of each subsequent directorship. So starting with de Wilde, going through John Leering, who's from 1964 to 1973. And John Leering is, I think, um, perhaps the most interesting person for our current policy. Um, because he, uh, he wanted to develop a relationship with the museum, or with the city, um, and, a, and a, an engagement of the museum with the political. I don't want to call it a political museum because that's immediately misunderstood, but an engagement with the decisions that are made collectively by a city, an engagement with the public sphere. Um, and he did perhaps one of the most important shows that the museum has ever done, an exhibition called The Street in 1969, following on from 68, where he actually, his initial plan was to change the routing of the street plan in Eindhoven so that the street would actually come right through the middle of the museum. Um, this attempt, already in the 60s, we've heard about it also in the 48 to 58 period, this attempt to communicate at a certain level with the community around, with the people who are passing through, literally with the passers-by, by, by incorporating the passers-by into the museum itself. Um, I'll go fairly quickly through the rest of the history. The, um, Rudy Fuchs, um, who subsequently did the documenta uh, in 1982, was director after Jean Leary. And, and I should say that the, those three directorships um, were major breaks from each other. So Eddie de Wilde represented a focus and a concentration on the School of Paris. He bought Picasso, he bought Delaunay, uh, he bought the post-war Paris, uh, Ecole de Paris artists. John Leary moved the focus to New York, 
And Rudy Fuchs moved it back again, you could say, to Cologne into the German painting of the late 1970s and early 1980s, the beginnings of Neue Bilder. So you see in each directorship a very positive move. Jan Debat, who was the subsequent director in the collection, um, was rather more of a, uh, uh, followed a, a rather similar strategy to Rudy Fuchs, I think, but concentrated initially on Belgium, because that's where he was from, and he knew that. So Jan Verkraus and those artists from the 90s. And then subsequently, quite late in his directorship, he moved to uh, Los Angeles and started to buy fairly major installations um, by Mike Kelly and Jason Rhodes. And the first work that I bought when I came in was a kind of rounding off of that by buying a Paul McCarthy. Not that I'm a great fan of Paul McCarthy, but it's interesting, as a director, you uh, inherit certain legacies. And those legacies are things that you also need to um, respect and to feel responsible, responsible for. So it was a way of rounding off the, the Los Angeles years in the museum. Um, so I took over in August 2004, and in a sense, I inherited something. I inherited this building. I also inherited the mythology of these four previous directors. Um, I also inherited a new building which was built in 2003, which is three times the size of the uh, original museum. Um, so, inherited a completely different operation in a way from, but on a management level certainly, um, from the one that had existed since 1936. There had been plans to make an extension of the Van Abbey Museum going back to the 1950s and then to build it. So it took around 50 years for this, this to be realized, and this was probably about the 20th version of the extension. That, uh, that you could have. It's, it's built by a, a Dutch architect who's actually born in Jerusalem, Abel Kahen. Um, and it has a problematic aspect to the architecture, but I won't go into that so much. Um, you can see that it's a kind of attempt. Um, we, were, we were seeing earlier um, pictures from, from Nina of the Guggenheim Museum. And you can see it's a kind of a attempt, in a sense, to, to construct a sort of anti-geometric form but not quite able to release itself enough from the, from the geometry. So it has this odd sort of halfway house between a sort of block, the block of, the, of, the, uh, of Keres's option for, for Warsaw and the sort of exploded, um, whatever it is, the exploded oval that, uh, that is the, uh, the, the Frank Gehry. It kind of doesn't quite know what it wants to be, which is, which is um, maybe one of the reasons that it has a certain amount of problems. If it had been one thing or the other more clearly, it would have been. Um, uh, perhaps more interesting, although perhaps even more problematic. So, the, as I've said, the Van Abbey Museum was constructed on the bourgeois public sphere, on this sphere which now exists, or no longer exists, or exists only as a, me uh, as a memory. Um, this museum then, in common, I think, with most other provincial museums in Western Europe, is therefore paradoxically homeless in its own city. In other words, the, the, the community for whom it was built, and even the community for whom this building in 2003 was built, a community that understood um, what art was, that went to the museum in order to identify with being part of the bourgeoisie, in order to identify with certain cultural values, but also social and political values, which that museum always represented. That that museum, that, 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 that audience, has largely crumbled. Um, and the, the question, I think lingers, the question remains and was, and was here this afternoon as well, the question is what kinds of communities can a museum like this anchor itself to? Because it needs communities to anchor itself to. What are the new versions of the bourgeoisie, which are often of course the rich, which are often the new rich, but nevertheless there could also be other options, which is what I'll try and suggest, but who are these new versions in which, which we need to anchor the museum to? Um, and we need to do that because the historic community that the museum was for. This isn't something that is willed by strange museum directors who say we don't want to serve the bourgeoisie anymore. It's not willed by, by um, political um, ideology. It's a fact that that bourgeoisie has disappeared. It maybe exists as a memory, as I say, as a, as a, as a, as a concept which some people still cling on to. But as an effective, mobilized unit of society which can defend or support the development of a museum, it no longer exists. So we're driven to look for new audiences. We're driven to, th to think about the public sphere through the historical change in class structures. And where the museum had previously been plugged into, it's now found itself homeless. It's found itself unable to plug into that anymore. Uh, and some museums keep on trying and kind of lose their way, and other museums, as we know, like the Guggenheim, go for um, a kind of mass market appeal, an appeal which is no longer based on the bourgeoisie, but based on certain 
basic marketing structure. Um, so this is the building that I inherited, and this is the collection that I inherited. This is Chagall and Delaunay. This is the collection of um, Eddie de Wilde. And the next one is the collection, more or less, of Jan Debout. I, I won't go through all of the collection. Um, but uh, here is Juan Munoz and Rosa Balka. Nick Kemp, a local Dutch artist. This kind of um, sculptural come uh, painting, uh, two-dimensional work is quite common in the, in the 80s and 90s. This is kind of how the 90s is represented. It's strange for me because it's not the 90s that I experienced as a young curator. It's a very different kind of 90s, which was reflected than the one that I experienced. So when I came to the museum, I thought, hang on, this is 80s, isn't it? This is something representing another field. But this is how the 90s is told in the museum, to a large extent. And then from John Leering, I inherited probably the most valuable um, part of the collection, or the basis on which we can build, which is the, uh, an archive, a partial archive, not the whole archive, but a partial archive of El Lizitsky. And an archive which represents, outside of the former Soviet Union, the biggest holdings of El Lizitsky anywhere. Um, it represents from, from um, drawings and paintings through to design work, to sketches for designs, to sketches for architectures, to sketches for town planning. Um, to uh, letters which are involved with his um, cultural ambassadorship for the Soviet Union in the period uh, between, um, 19, between Lenin's death and, and, uh, and 35. Um, this this uh, um, incredibly active person who's a teacher, he's working in Unovis in, in, in Vitebsk, um, who's uh, a designer, who's um, making um, uh, radical arch architectural statements in, in world's fairs and international exhibitions throughout the 1920s and into the 1930s. Um, this person who's um, not interested in originality, who's not interested in, uh, in, 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 in authorship, um, who's working collaboratively, sometimes with Malevich. We bought a piece recently, which is from Vitebsk, um, and uh, we bought it on a guess that it was genuine, and then we found it out luckily later that it was. Um, but because it wasn't sure if it was genuine or not, it was quite cheap. Um, but um, this, this piece, it, we don't know who signed it. It's, we don't know whether it's Malevich or Lizitsky, or Malevich, Lizitsky, and some of the students in Vitebsk who are actually working on it. And it, it is almost a fusion of Lizitsky and Malevich's languages. It's fascinating. And they're not concerned about this. Yeah, they're making proposals for public artworks, for huge signs, huge, huge abstract uh, um, uh, suprematist or constructivist um, sculptures on the streets of Vitebsk, on the streets of Moscow, on the streets, streets of, of Leningrad, as it was then. Um, changing this, this, uh, this, uh, this, trying to reach the workers. We were talking about this before. Yeah, desperately trying to see if they can communicate. And also in the records of Vitebsk, which, which we were rehearsing, actually trying to measure that and see whether people, whether the workers are responding or not, whether they are understanding this strange, um, abstracted language of forms moving through space, which they don't recognize, but nevertheless are kind of being prepared for the idea of the new man, the new socialist, the new communist man, mostly a man in this case, but not always, um, that, would, that would emerge as a result of the revolution, you know, preparing the ground for, the, for, this, uh, for this moment. So you can see that in a sense having this archive, which has, and this is the presentation of it now, we're about to change it in November, we're going to do a radical reconstruction of this, of this uh, presentation, which we've been busy on the last three um, years trying to put together. Um, but that this, this, this um, presentation of, of, or this, this um, source of inspiration, this source of information, this source of possibility, the role of the artist in society, of the artist's engagement with the political, of the artist's engagement with the radical aesthetics that's meant to try and suggest a new imagination, even a new man. And of course there's dangers in that ideology, there's no doubt. But nevertheless, it exists and we have it. And we can use it, I think, in a far, far more um, effective way than we do at the moment, where what has happened is that the force of the market, you could say, or at least the forces of tradition, the forces of art history, have reduced Elisitsky to an artist, pure, pure and simple. Uh, and I don't mean that to demean the role of the artist, but I mean that he was an artist all the time in everything he did, but they reduced it to an artist in the terms that art historians understand. So they talk about original analogy, they talk about signature, they talk about authorship, they talk about his personality and his role in ways that I don't think he would have minded, as far as we can know. He wouldn't have recognized. He wouldn't have understood what they were going on about, largely. Of course, he was interested in his own ideas and getting his own ideas across, but he saw the possibility to do that in a very different way from the way that it's interpreted throughout history. So this, 
the Lisitsky archives, the Lisitsky work which we have, gives us a tremendous possibility to do things. Now, that's the inheritance that I began with, and I'm going to quickly take you through some projects because otherwise I think I'll run out of time. I've got about 20 minutes left. Yeah? So I'd like to leave 15 minutes at the end or something else. So I'll go through quickly. Okay, that was the, the heritage that I took over in, in 2004. Um, and I started with um, two terms that were meant to be uh, kind of two poles of an engine, positive and minus, that would actually turn the museum around. Um, what you have to imagine is a museum like ours is around 40 full-time people and around another 20 or 30 part-time people. So there's a lot of faces in, in the museum staff. Far too many, I think. But anyway, that's the ways of dealing with unemployment, things like that. Um, but um, but the, the, um, the, it means that it's quite a big ship. I mean, it sounds relatively small, and I know if some CEO of uh, some big multinational would just laugh at it. But for me, it's quite a big ship. You have to try and inspire all those people individually if you want them to change their behavior. Um, and I'm not a manager. I'm not trained as a manager. I'm interested in art. I'm interested in art's potential to imagine the world otherwise. That's why I got this job, I think. Um, but not because I was a good manager. So I'm trying to change this organization, trying to um, let it see the Lisitskis in a different way, try and let it see the collection in different ways. And of course, the, 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 the institution, which is used to behaving in certain ways, resists. It doesn't resist necessarily consciously sometimes, but that you can deal with, but it resists unconsciously. It's like you're learning new moves as a body. You're used to moving your hand like this, you can do it all the time. If somebody says, move it like that, and you go, no, it's easier like that. I want to do that. Isn't it? Or even, oh, no, it's really hard. Or, and just as soon as, as, soon as st anybody stops looking, you start doing that again, because it's easier. And, and so it's not a kind of ideological resistance that's going on, but nevertheless it is. So how do you get this situation to move? How do you get people to start to see things differently? Um, and what I tried, and it has partial success, I would say, definitely partial, but it has some element of success, is to use two terms which are kind of poles which, um, in thinking about a, an engine and thinking about the need to have a positive in mind, is in order to get movement. The two terms are radicality, which later I translated to experimentalism, because uh, radicalismo, which is the Dutch word, is um, simply, uh, uh, simply understood only in political terms and only in leftist political terms and only basically as communism. So we have this Elisitsky <laughs> archive and then I'm saying let's be radical. And what it means, for me not at all, but, but what it was translating as um, is, is, is let's be communist or something, which is actually not the intention at all. So anyway, radicalism has been replaced by experimentalism. I think that's weaker, at least in English, but nevertheless it's more easy to communicate. And the other term um, was hospitality. So radic radicalism, which I'll keep using in English, and hospitality um, are the terms which were meant to drive it. And the way that they would drive it, the way that they are driving it, I think, is by being aware of the question of the public through hospitality, while understanding that the museum has a point of view, that it wants not to be a manager, as Gary said, the, 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 who was it, Netanyahu who said that, one of the prime ministers. Uh, yeah. Okay, Olmert said that, okay. Uh, but Olmert saying that he wanted to be a, a manager of, of, of Israel and simply do the, the good, the, what was necessary as a manager. I mean, uh, radicalism is meant to indicate the opposite of that. That what it's not about is being hospitable for hospitality's sake. What it's not about is confirming art history or confirming people's prejudices. You know, what we do not want to do is an Andy Warhol exhibition, which I think is simply the confirmation of art history. So radicalism keeps us on that level against the Andy Warhol exhibition. Not that there's anything wrong with it, but it shouldn't be what we do. We have to do something else. The Tate Museum or the State Labour Museum in Amsterdam can do the Andy Warhol exhibition, that's fine. Um, and on the other hand, hospitality keeps you grounded so that you at least should um, try through the various educational means at your disposal, through the various means of marketing at your disposal, but also through hopefully simple human contact with each other, you should try and create an environment in which that radicalism can be understood, in which people, though they might feel unhappy with the message, at least feel com comfortable in the place where that message is being told, and at least feel welcome. That, ironically, the radicalism has been by far easier <laughs> to instill in the museum than hospitality. Because radicalism is, is controlled at the level of the program, at the level of the activities that you do. And hospitality is something human. And 
the Northwest Europe does not understand hospitality. I mean, that's my conclusion, having travelled around the Middle East and other parts of the world. Um, that that, that hospitality isn't a concept which is which is which is understood on any level. Um, uh, and I think and I think I hope you know what I'm talking about. And this audience should understand it better than others. Um, uh, so, so it's it's a very foreign idea. Yeah? Whether it's whether it's the Derridian idea of radical hospitality, of just saying yes, or it's the simple notion of hospitality, of of, of opening yourself as a human being up to the other person, yeah? of allowing the other person to see you. And what I'm, and the people I'm talking about are the guards, are what we call the chicharones, who are the people we brought into the museum um, to speak about the art with our visitors. Are the, the what we call the hosts and hostesses, the chaster gastron. That's a word that's better in Dutch than in English. Um, these uh, these people who are all volunteers who come to the museum and um, are trained by us or de develop certain um, uh, relationships to the art, certain opinions about the art at the same time, um, which would uh, which would allow it to um, which would allow those kind of conversations and those exchange of opinions to happen at the very banal level. Hospitality is quite banal, thing. it's not a great thing. It's quite banal, but it's nevertheless really, really important. And I think that's been very difficult to, to, to inculcate into the museum, to bring in. So, the question of radicality and, and, uh, and hospitality have been, um, in a way, the crucial aspects of hospitality. So, hospitality, of course, also, and I think that goes back to the Derrida moment, hospitality, this idea of just saying yes, can have huge consequences. And I think we're learning about some of those consequences now. For instance, um, there's a, there's, there is a group of artists in Eindhoven who are quite active, and that question which we had yesterday from Dali about Hadzili, about how do you deal with the local artists, um, we, they, they wanted to occupy the museum in a certain way because we had some criticism locally and they wanted to defend us and they wanted to do that defense through occupying a certain space in the museum. And I said as the director, yes, because that's our policy, is hospitality and hospitality is fundamental. That yes had huge consequences because it seemed that we were doing something which, which was moving the museum like that and not like that anymore. In other words, it wasn't planning and structuring and organizing and delivering. It was just going, yeah do what you want to do. And what they did was not very good. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't outstandingly brilliant. Uh, but nevertheless, it seemed, it seemed so worthwhile under, under that rubric of hospitality to do it. What it did do was shift the relationships in the museum. Suddenly the guards who spoke to these, these youngish kids in the late 20s to the 30s, um, suddenly kind of understood something that the curators didn't necessarily understand because they hadn't had those conversations because they were just in the museum. So there were different kinds of conversations going on, and it was very nice to see some of the guards explaining to the curators what was going on. You know, so, you, so, you, so, so that moment, but also it was, it is very difficult, and, and you know, the, the demand that I get all the time is when are we going to, to stop this project? You know, because there is no end date. You can't have an end to hospitality. Hospitality leaves when the guest leaves. So you can't have an end date, yeah? but it needs to have an end date in order for the system to understand what to do with it. Um, so these, these kind of conflicts, I think, are, are extremely, uh, I mean, they can be inspiring. They're also um, very demotivating at times as well. That, that, that constructing a museum like this, trying to turn it around those concepts of radicalism and hospitality, can sometimes feel like bike, biking a bicycle uphill, a very steep hill. Yeah, the moment that you let go, you go straight back down again. <laughs> you're constantly being forced to drive the motor. Um, and it's also about building alliances with the museum and, and making sure there are other people that are driving the motor, and that's getting, getting easier. But I think it's not a, um, I, I don't want to, 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 you to feel sorry for me, but I also want to say that this is not unproblematic. It's quite easy for me to present what we do in the museum and present some of the ideas in the museum in an unproblematic way, you know, to say, look at us, aren't we amazing? And we do all these things. And I've done it before, to be honest. And I'm getting increasingly uh, unhappy about doing that and not explaining that these difficulties um, are a consequence of this policy. Yeah? They're not something which comes up um, because people don't follow. They're a consequence of trying to change the aspects of the museum. Now let me just take you through, I'm really doing badly for time. Can I have 15 minutes? Yeah. 
13. Um, so as I said, inheriting this collection, and what I wanted to do was talk a little bit about the collection quickly. Inheriting this collection, inher inheriting this history, was the kind of playground that you could work on. Yeah, this was the fascinating thing. Inheriting this history from 1936, inheriting the, the re-beginning after the Second World War in 45, was an extraordinarily rich possibility. And what we did um, was um, basically uh, adopt this idea of plugins. Plugins, which is taken from Cedric Park Price, who's a kind of quite trendy architect who died recently, was from work with Archigram in the 60s. Um, and he developed this notion of a plug-in city, the idea that buildings would come and go at kind of fairly rapid intervals, um, cheaply built, and that there would be no kind of master plan. There would be an idea of plug -in, plug -in, plugging in whenever things were necessary, um, a kind of supply on demand sort of system of architecture. Um, and I think that's what, that's what we adopted, this supply on demand idea of, of, uh, of, of, uh, of the exhibitions, inviting artists, Curators from outside Northwest Europe, so curators from um, various parts of the world, from South Africa to, to, to Korea, etc., um, to take the collection and to play with it. Actually, to, in a sense, throw the dice with the collection and see what comes up. As an artist, integrate your own work. As a, as a, um, as a curator, integrate your own position. And I'll give you a few examples just to see. This is a piece by Pavel Buchler, who's a Czech artist, Czechoslovak artist, he was born in Czechoslovakia left Czechoslovakia and left to Britain in, in the 80s as a, as a uh, refugee. Um, and this is a piece called The Castle, which was also shown in Istanbul in the Biennale in 2005, for some of you might have been there. Um, it's shown together with, this is the Picasso on the left that we have, this is the Delaunay, which you saw earlier in that more classical presentation. And what you have here is a, is a series of uh, speakers, actually Philip speakers, ironically, that were produced in the 1930s. Um, and these, uh, these speakers are familiar from, from um, uh, factory gates to, to announce, that, uh, but also from air raid sirens and things like that. Um, on the soundtrack is a um, computer voice repeating in German and English a short um, extract from Kafka's The Castle. And it's the extract when uh, Joseph K. Joseph K. becomes aware that um, that uh, he is um, never going to meet Herr Klamm and that he's basically being rejected. And it says at one point, "You are not from the castle. You are not from the village. You are uh, nothing. In fact, you are worth, worth worse than nothing. You are a stranger." And then there's a small um, sort of triumphant little. Uh, blast of horns, a sort of brass band that plays, and then it repeats. It's a slightly longer sec section than that, but it basically that's the core of it. And the idea behind this presentation was to try and bring back some of the alienation that these works must have evoked when they were originally painted. What's happened in the museum is that these works have become confirmed within art history as being masterpieces, whatever that means. They become confirmed in terms of their, their, their value as being completely integrated into the modernist Dutch story of itself. So they have absolutely no shock value. They're rather like going and seeing a picture on a chocolate box. Um, they simply are about a recognition and a familiarity. Nothing wrong with that, that's fine, but it could also be something else. It's not to say this is the only way to present them, but it's an alternative. And by having this sound, um, you immediately disrupt the idea of standing in front of a painting and contemplating it. You have this sound shouting in your ear, literally shouting at some point in your ear. And this construction, which was done by the artist, but obviously done in discussion with everybody, um, was, a, was an idea of, of instituting that idea of alienation and then saying that probably at the time, this is not something you could confirm, of course, but it's an idea of the artist, that at the time, this idea of not being from the castle, not being from the village, being nothing, in fact, being worth being a stranger, is what these paintings were doing in society. They, they were alienating us. They, they, were, they were showing us fragments of a world that was in formation, which wasn't necessarily the world that we wanted to see. Another example is Lily van der Stocker, who's a Dutch artist, um, who designed this wallpaper and also the carpet, and we made this. And this, this takes me to another project that we're busy with, um, where with the, the idea of the white cube, and this, and this museum is nothing if not a, mu a museum of white cubes stacked one on top of each other. Um, the idea of the white cube is, as we all know from Brian O'Doherty from Inside the White Cube onwards, a, a totally ideological uh, construct. It's about the idea of a disembodied eye, you know, this, this disembodied eye without a body, looking at the work in this pure, sterile space. Um, but in the early days of modernism and throughout the period, 
Artists have always been busy with thinking about constructions of showing art of their time, which are very different from the YQ. The Prown Room of Lizitsky, which was a room for showing his own work, but also Maholi Noj, the Ram de Gegenwart, the room of uh, the contemporary. Um, and I could go on. And this is a kind of um, contemporary version of that, that Lily van der Stocker um, made this room and then invited various artists to show in this room. And she took responsibility for inviting the artists, but also we guaranteed that we would buy the work within financial limits, that we would buy the work that she showed. So not only is this history of the, of the, um, of the uh, room, Lily's room, in a sense, building up, this is Andreas Ittel, formerly worth some videos. Um, this is the next piece by Esther Tielemans. Um, not only were these, were these um, pieces, I haven't got the other one, sorry. Um, not only were these pieces um, being uh, brought, brought up, um, and, and not only were these pieces being made, in a sense, for the um, room itself, um, but they also then come into the collection. So there will, after a certain time, be a kind of Lily van der Stocker corner of the collection where these works shown in this configuration will exist. But also these works can, of course, be shown apart from this room. They're also autonomous from this location. So they could go back into the white cube at some time. And it's always about keeping those options open, I think. It's not about closing off the traditions, but it's about laying those traditions next to other kinds of possibilities. Here's a nice work by uh, Kim Hun Jin, who's a, a, a curator from Korea, where um, she put the drawing collection, um, took as many as possible, as many as we were allowed by the museum system, out of uh, their, their um, frames, um, and showed them in this sort of almost random sort of order. It was, it's actually very, not, not necessarily ordered, but it's very carefully thought through, but it's this impression of randomness. And what happens on the wall opposite, so diagonally opposite, is this piece in the collection by Dan Flavin. Um, and basically, the, I mean, one of the possibilities is to see these works out of their frames for the first time and to look at them individually. Um, and, and I think that's possible. You know, when we're talking about the idea of how you impose a context on a reading, I think always the public are able to ignore that context and to simply focus on one of these images. I think that that's what you have to do in television all the time. I mean, we're very acute visually, yeah? so we can ignore the extraneous, uh, extraneous visual sound of a work and concentrate on one. I think we have that capability. So I'm not worried about, about um, denying people that possibility in this sense, but at the same time there's another layer, and the layer is this, if you like, postmodernist um, uh, position curated by an aging curator, which I don't think is coincidental, against this modernist order of the Dan Flavin. The trick or the, the, the pleasure, in a sense, in the work when you realise it is that, of course, or well, not of course, but the fact is that these lights are allowing us to see this work, because this is the only light in the room. So without the damp flavor, and without this reliance on this modernist order, then you wouldn't be able to see the postmodernist chaos on the opposite side of the wall. So the, the, this, this interrelation, this interdependency is not simply about you know, bad goods, but also about necessary, and then a relationship of necessity, which I think is, is quite a nice example. Um, this is the, what's called the Kaik Depot, the viewing depot where people can choose their own work. I want to go fast because I want to find city. Just to show that we also use the white cube in fairly traditional ways, and this is also Maria Eichel. These are works. This is Dan Pajowski, which is a piece that we hired from the artist for five years. So he changes it. I don't know if you know him, he draws on the walls, basically, various kind of cartoon like pieces. You can see some of them here. Um, but uh, we, again, kind of tr trying to devise new models of, of questions of ownership and bringing things into the collection. Um, and then very quickly, and I'm not going to talk about the exhibitions, at the same time as working with the collection, we expanded the notion of the collection to include everything that's around the, art, the, the object of art itself. And by including everything around the object of art, we started to think about the archives, which you see in the museum, as being part of the collection. So therefore, what that enabled us to do was to start to present the archives. And this is the exhibition that I was talking about before, The Street, or, uh, um, by Jean Leering, which was a very important predecessor, I think, to some of our other exhibitions. Um, and that this allowed us to, to look at um, the press reaction and the initial reaction to The Street, the documentation that survives, in some cases work which has survived, because we have slide presentations which we used in the exhibition, which ended up in the archive, because people didn't classify them as art properly, so we could actually reconstruct through um, this, I mean, the archive is also this, this journey of discovery for the museum and for the museum archivists as well, because suddenly you ask a different question of the archivist. Again, it's this kind of change of movement. Yeah? 
You ask them not to preserve, but to present. And to think about the archive as a tool for presentation, not as a, not as a, as a, a memory bank of information. Um, so this, this uh, living archive presents us with various possibilities. Here is the whole chronology of the museum starting in 1940. On the three lines, there's world history, art history, and Banaba history going down. And then on each of the plinths is, um, this is maybe easy to see. On each of the plinths is a document from the archive shown in a quite classical uh, uh, system as an artwork. So you have Lily van der Stocker upstairs shown in a very non-white cube and you have the archive shown in this way. And again, it's meant to provoke, to what extent does it provoke, I don't know, but it's meant to provoke a kind of questioning of this sense of hierarchy of information and this, this erratic power of the object. And those, the archive from 1937 start to, to, um, to relate, start to have an erratic power just because of its age, um, which uh, otherwise it might not do if it wasn't presented here. Here is uh, the Living Archive number three where we started to show artworks together with documentation. Um, so this, this then becomes a, a series where again, I, I believe that you can isolate yourself and look at this Immendorf in isolation, but at the same time you can understand how it relates to certain things um, by looking at the archive itself. Right, I'm not going to talk about the exhibition. Can I have five minutes? Because <laughs> I'd like to just. Um, so that's the museum, and in, in five minutes, I'd just like to, to raise a couple of issues or a couple of thoughts in relationship to, I suppose, more the, the, the theory of museum development or what um, museums might be, and that, uh, um, or, what, or what the possibilities might be, and where and where that might come from. And there are two historical points of view which, which are for me very important at least to think about and, I, and, and what I sometimes call these is the idea of uh, the roads less, less, less travelled by in museum history because there is a dominant museum history, museum history which leads from MoMA to, to wherever, you can make it up, you know what it is, yeah, this, I'm not going to list it, I haven't got time, but there is a dominant museum history but there are also lots of byways, lots of lesser travelled paths. And two, I think, are interesting. One is going right back to the 18th century, to the beginning of the museums, not to the British Museum as Nina did. I think it's important to remember that, that those histories, but to the Louvre. And um, in the first years of the Louvre, it, when it was first opened, it spoke about being, this was in the early revolutionary period, remember, after 1789, when the aristocracy's um, property is being expropriated by the state and brought together in the Louvre, the former royal palace. So it's really this occupation like the kids in Eindhoven are doing with the museum. It's this occupation of this royal palace. And they say, right, what are we going to do with it? We're going to preserve all this stuff. It was about preservation. And we're going to make a museum. And we're going to make a museum which is an inspiration. And this should be a museum of the people, de la peur, of the people. And then the French Revolution goes on, and a guy called Napoleon comes to power, and things change, and it becomes an empire. And the definition of the museum changes from de la peuple to pour la peuple, for the people. So this for the people becomes the dominant paradigm in the Louvre subsequently and becomes the development. And this, this relationship between of the people, between possession, between it being yours and something that's serving you, and something that then serves you in all sorts of ideological ways, you could say, but serves you, is I think a radical break. It's a very small word, but I think it represents a radical, uh, different kind of understanding of what the museum could be. And I suppose what I'm interested in doing is going back and seeing what this of the people might have meant if we can develop it in, into the future. Or at least, and it's again, I think, the stress on running parallel histories. Yeah? It's not really, what I'm not interested in is a kind of critique of the great museum world or a sort of a, you know, a, 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 an old sort of leftist notion of, of revolution and, and, and replacement, yeah? of, of turning the wheel so that everything turns upside down, the world turned upside down, that kind of model from this, we inherit from this English Civil War and, and, and so on, revolution. Um, it's more about, at this point, I think, allowing certain distinctions or parallel histories to be running at the moment. To, to what an important term for me is this idea that the, the art museum, well, the museum should be the vessel, should be the place where art allows you to imagine the world otherwise than it is now. And that's an incredibly hard thing to do, to imagine the world otherwise. I mean, try it once. So just try closing your eyes and imagining this place otherwise. And us doing something else, but still all being together and still doing something. It's really difficult. 
to imagine the world otherwise. It's not an easy thing to do. But nevertheless, it's a challenge that I think the museums could take up, or at least some museums could take up, because other museums can do the thing they do very well. And we are doing what we try to do quite badly, I think. I mean, we're not very experienced in it, and we're learning those movements. And we haven't got so many models. There are other museums like, like MAPA, like a Moderna Gallery in, in, in Ljubljana, which is an important model for us. Um, and some historic models as well, even the Van Abbe Museum in the past with Jean Leary. Um, but nevertheless, it's this learning to act that is more difficult than doing the thing that's expected of you. But it's also, in the end, more fun. So this history of taking for the people away and replacing it with of the people and seeing what that does is quite important. The other important quote or important um, idea that has been inspiring for me is from 1967. And it's from Alan Capro, an American performance artist and inventor of the happenings, basically. Uh, for, we did a big exhibition of his at the end of 2006, so I kind of got into his work even more through, through that process. And he had a museum uh, show, his first museum show in 1967. He'd started working in the mid-50s, so, uh, and he'd refused most museum shows up to then, but then he finally decided. And he wrote a small introduction, and here are two paragraphs from it. And remember, this is 1967. He says, I'm put off by museums in general. They reek of a holy death which offends my sense of reality. Moreover, apart from my personal view, most adva advanced art of the last half dozen years, that's going back to 62, is in my view inappropriate for museum display. It is an art of the world, enormous scale, environmental scope, mixed media, spectator particip participation, technology, themes drawn from the daily milieu. He's defining an art of the past in 1967 like this. Museums do more than isolate such works from life. They su subtly sanctify it and thus kill it. But, speaking practically, Museums are often useful, for there are not yet the agencies or means for otherwise making art accessible to the public. The issue is not so much the abolition of all museums, they are entirely proper for the art of the past. It is rather the extension of the museum function into the domain of contemporary needs, in which it can act as a force of innovations lying outside of its physical limits. Eventually, in this way, the modern museum may gradually lose that cloying association of holiness that it presently inherits from another age. Hopefully, it will become an educational institute, a computerized bank of cultural history, and an agency for action. Now, what for me is really interesting about that quote, and this is where I'm going to end, is, is, is I mean, the atmosphere of it, the fact that it's written in 67 and talks about an art of the past, of the past five years, which seems to describe, in terms of much of, of the terminology, an art that is from the last five years, from 2008. Um, so, so seems to still be incredibly relevant. But at the same time, the most important things are, are this idea of the museum as a force of innovations lying outside of its physical limits. We've talked a lot about architecture, a lot about building, a lot about the, the uh, construction of a public that comes in through the, through the door. We've talked a lot about the, the, the very good point that one of you made here, I can't see you in the light, um, about the question of the public sphere and how much influence can a museum really have with the public sphere? What can it possibly do? And I think we have to see that the influence of the museum is not the exhibition necessarily, and it's not the people who come to that exhibition. It's the creation of a standpoint, the creation of a point of view, and at a point of view that then, that then seeps out of the museum and becomes, if it's good, a force for innovation lying outside of its physical limits, maybe outside of its audience limits. I think if an audience does a good job, it makes something possible that wasn't possible before. It makes something possible to be thought that wasn't possible before by presenting art that does that. And we're always dependent on art and the artist's role in this. But nevertheless, we have an active role in this presentation, and it's a very active role. It's a role almost parallel with the artist, I would say. So this force of innovation lying outside of its physical limits is, for me, an important way to think about this question of the public sphere. It's not only the people who cross the threshold. It's the people that are infected by outside of the, the box. And the other thing that's important is this very nice tripartite discussion of the museum, which I think still, in many ways, holds true almost exactly today. And, and he says a museum will hopefully become an educational institute a bank of cultural history, cultural history, not art history, cultural history, 
which goes back to the question of the photographs that we saw at the beginning, mm -hmm. and an agency for action. It's a very demanding menu <laughs> to fulfill all those three. But it would be, I think, in the fulfilling of those, in the being measured as a museum against those kind of criteria, education, cultural history, action, or an agency for action, um, that um, maybe we can bring certain other criteria to bear on the question of the museum than the criteria of visitor figures and economic um, survivability, economic success. So 